we will follow bringing hope to the world. Here's the scary thing. You're the only person that, you're the only Bible that some people read. I'm the only Bible that some people read. They have no hope. They're looking for hope. They're not certainly going to find it on the news. Sure they're not. But they can find it as they observe, as they watch us about our daily business, how we respond, how we have hope, not only for a future, but hope for today. Tremendous words. Thank you for bringing that song. And so, Father, may we follow close after you with that passion that this song talks about, bringing hope to our families, bringing hope to our neighbors, bringing hope to our work colleagues. Well, may all these songs that we sing be more than mere words. May they be the reality of our lives each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's your appreciation to the team. Thank you, guys. Uh, we appreciate all those different giftings and, and abilities that uh, just make our services what they are. And uh, so I think we have kids today going out and youth are going out. Also, if you have a baby that needs fed, the baby room is just through here to my left and your right. And then on beyond that is the toddler's room. So if you have a toddler that's on saddle, then the, you can, uh, those, are, those are there to facilitate you. So please make use of them. And the screens are in there and the sound is connected through also. Okay, have a good time out there, Mass Exodus. Just check there's not people going out there that aren't going to youth or Sunday school. <laughs> I'm going to get these all tagged. It could be people trying to escape. Okay, if you put the slides up, please. As you know, we've been started a little series uh, in September uh, called Connected. And we've been looking at throughout the year, how we're connected to our chromosomes, our past and our culture and customs and all that. But then one day we met Jesus and we're connected to him. And that's where our life flow comes from as we are connected to him and he's connected to us and we abide in the vine. And, and then we've been looking at different, this whole area of wholeness, how Jesus is wanting to raise us to be a certain type of people. And so we, last time we looked about the importance of integrity, that unity within ourselves. Week before, we, we looked at this whole idea of are we campers? Are we climbers? Are we quitters? Uh, God wants us to climb to the top in everything he has for us. And so today's title is No Room for Excuses. God hates excuses. We're going to see that as we go through this. And there's, there's no reason to have excuses, as we'll see. But we looked at this whole aspect that our job as the church, our job as individual believers is to connect people to Christ. That's what we've been singing about, that we be a hope to the world, that we can be a witness, that we can help connect people, help people find Jesus as we have found him. Then to connect them to the body of Christ, but people just can't be Christians on their own. We're supposed to be part of a body. We talked about that ligaments and joints. We said, are you a ligament or are you just a leg? Uh, because the leg's just messing about, but the ligament is supplying to someone else. And so we, every one of us, are, be, as we are being supplied from the head, Jesus, we supply to each other and encourage and bless each other. And then we want to connect people to their purpose, the saddest people in the world are people who don't know what their purpose in life is. And we have a little sign at the front. I don't know if you can see it. It says the two happiest days of your life are the day you were born, the day you discovered the reason why. We were all created and designed by God for a purpose. He has a plan for our lives. And that's part of our job to help people find that. Then it's to help develop people's gifting, their character, and their maturity for life. So we want people to grow up strong in, in, in God and, and the giftings that they have, being able to help them develop those, etc. And then prepare them for Christ's coming and for eternity. 
We don't hear much chat about the return of Jesus nowadays. When I was a little boy, it was all Jesus is coming back and you better be ready. You don't hear so much of that now, but Jesus is coming back. And not only is he coming back, but he wants us to be prepared for eternity. So we, we had a look at that. We've been looking at this verse, and I'm going to look at a slightly different aspect of this. And, and Jeanette has been picking this up on the Tuesday nights in the Aglow course. And you, as Jeanette says, you're probably going to be sick of this verse. But you can't say that. You can't say you're sick of Bible verses. That, would, that would, doesn't sound right. Sure, it doesn't. We're probably thinking, how many more times is he going to mention this? Listen, there's so many aspects and dimensions and views and, and diamond. When you look at a diamond, when you look at Megan's diamond, I don't know how much that costs. I wouldn't like to ask. <laughs> I hope Wattie doesn't have to pay that for Lindsay whenever if they ever decide to get married, for goodness sake. Hi, Wattie, if you're watching online, any chance? This flipping woman's still living in my house. <laughs> Was that one of those things that popped into my head and popped out of my mouth? <laughs> anyway, may God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together, spirit, soul, and body. And Jeanette, we, last Tuesday night, we looked at eating and healthy eating and all those things. And we're looking at all the different things that will make us healthy and whole, spirit, soul, and body. But it goes on to say, make and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is coming back for a fit bride. That's why Chig's marrying Megan, because she's fit. <laughs> That's what men are looking for now. They're a fit woman, aren't they? The women are looking for a fit man. That's, I'm just reading what, this is what the Bible says. Jesus is coming back for a bride that's fit. Without spot or wrinkle, as we're going to see in a moment. In fact, uh, Apostle Paul picks this up in Ephesians. And he's not really even talking about this. He's just talking about the family and about husbands and wives and children and all this sort of thing. But in the middle of it, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved his bride, the church. He gave up his life for her. Christ, Christ's love makes the church whole. There's that word again wholeness, spirit, soul, and body. We know he gave himself up completely to make her his own, washed by the cleansing of his word. He has given himself so that he can present the church as his radiant bride, unstained, unwrinkled, unblemished, completely free from all impurity, holy and innocent before him. Now, here's a scary thing. Look at the person beside you and say, that's you. That's me. When we read that, we think, oh, well, that's somebody else. Does that, anybody think that? Does anybody think, oh, well, that's me. I'm going to be a radiant bride, unstained, unwrinkled, unblemished, completely free from all impurity, holy and innocent. That's us. So there's a wee bit of work to do, isn't there? We're going to have to edge forward to a bit more faith to faith, glory to glory, this walk of sanctification. Otherwise, the Lord's never going to come back. We'll all have died of coronavirus. <laughs> and sadly, that's not a joke, unfortunately, because lots of people, this is the, the work, the enemy's work. You see, there's no disease in heaven. There was no disease in the garden. We live in a fallen world, and it's so... It's a scary thing, it is. So we're not making light of anybody's situations where that has happened. And so uh, we pray for those families. But listen, it, Jesus needs to come back. The world's in a state. That's the point I'm trying to make. And so Peter goes on to say this. And, and so this seems a very daunting task to be this bride that Jesus is preparing. But here's what Peter says. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, grace means divine influence on the heart. And so we're not on our own here. So when, when Peter uh, says grace to you, he said, there's a divine influence on your heart that's affecting your everyday life from you get up in the morning to you go to sleep at night, even during the night as you sleep, God's divine influence is working on you. 
He's shaping you. He's molding you. He's saying, just no, don't go down that road. What does the, uh, Psalm 16 says? He gives us rains in the night seasons. And, and so when we don't know what to do, the Holy Spirit's influence on our heart is working. Sometimes I was chatting to somebody before the service and they said, looking back, they can, they can trace God's hand in their job situation. And, and so sometimes we go through things in life and we actually don't realize God is leading us and providing for us and, and that we're closer to the mark sometimes than we think we are. So grace, divine influence on the heart and peace, nothing broken, nothing broken, nothing missing. That's wholeness. If, if nothing is missing in your life and nothing's broken in your life, you've got wholeness. As his divine power has given to us all things, I love this, this verse, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. God has given us everything, all things that pertain unto life, everyday life, getting up, walking about, eating, sleeping, all that life. God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, unto spirituality. So we, we have no excuse. We have everything that we need. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have given, been given to us exceedingly. These are the Mr. Kipling promises. For those of you who know those ads who are old enough to know Mr. Kipling has exceedingly great cakes. He's given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. But you know, if you don't read the scriptures, you're not going to know what they are. If you're not in the word, you're not going to know what they are. By which has been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, listen to this, we might be partakers of the divine nature. That blows my mind. That bl probably blows all our minds because we know that we understand the human nature. But this scripture is saying through these precious promises, through the word of God, we are becoming, we become part of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. So, ready or not, Jesus is coming. I play hide and seek with John, my grandson. And uh, so when we play hide and seek, maybe you've done that in the past, or you play with your kids or grandkids. Say, ready or not, here I come. Uh, and so, ready or not, there's a day coming when Jesus will return. And so all excuses are equal. You see some of these little signs around the place. All excuses are equal. There's not one excuse that's better than another, as we'll see as we go through some scriptures in a moment. All excuses are created equal. They have their same result, no success. Remember we read the scripture and Jeanette read it to us on Tuesday night about John prayed, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health. One of the translations is succeed and be in health as your soul prospers. And so excuses stop us succeeding. They hinder our success. I found this in Google yesterday. All, or sorry, excuses are lies we tell ourselves so that it doesn't have to be our fault. Excuses are all about blame, aren't they? Excuses are always about deflecting what has happened onto somebody else or something else. So excuses are lies we tell ourselves so that it doesn't have to be our fault. And so, going on to the next little slide. Excuses began in the garden. I thought that was nearly a dodgy photograph, but anyway, that's Adam and Eve in the garden. And uh, that's what it was like, apparently. And uh, so excuses began there. You can see the snake. You can see Adam and Eve. And so listen to what it says. This is in Genesis 3. <clears throat> when the cool, we, we know God created Adam and Eve. He put them in this uh, perfect environment. He said, look, there's only one. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Every other tree you can eat of, everything else is fine. Don't eat of that tree. And so when the cool of the evening uh, breezes were blowing, Adam and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, so here's excuse number one, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. You see, God said, where are you? The answer is, uh, over here, Lord. That's the answer, isn't it? 
it's not this whole palaver. You know, you know you're going to get an excuse when somebody starts with the whole preamble. It takes 20 minutes to get to the point. You ever had those conversations? He said, where are you? It's a simple question. Where are you? I'm here. God wasn't asking him because he didn't know where he was. God was asking him to see how he would respond. He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? Listen to this. This, this is probably the scariest excuse. This is a, an excuse that will get you killed. The man replied, this is a double whammy excuse. If you want to know, some excuses are good, but this is a, as Frank Carson, this is a cracker. The man replied, it was the woman Excuse part A of the excuse. You give me. So it's your fault, God. Don't be coming along here asking where I am in the garden. It's your fault. You see this doll. You see this fit bride that you give me. She's causing the trouble. And it's not her fault because you, you give her to me. So it's actually your fault. So Adam was actually blaming God in his excuse. He wasn't only blaming his wife, but he was blaming God. He said, the man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me. She replied, that's why I ate it. So her excuse was it was the serpent's fault. The poor serpent had nobody to blame, and so he got it on the backside, So, uh, as we know. Uh, and so we see right in the Garden of Eden, right in the fall of man, excuses and blame were at the heart of it. And we'll see in a moment or two the difference between an excuse and a reason. Two different things. And so Jesus actually picked up the theme of excuses. So this is not a one-off. I always say I love the, con the continuity of the scriptures. What you find in Genesis, you'll find in other places. You'll find in Jesus' teaching. You'll find in the, in the epistles, etc., etc. And Jesus, this is talking about Jesus coming back. This is talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a big image that Jesus has given here. This is talking about the return of Christ and the church being ready. Now, he was speaking to Jewish people, so it has a Jewish connotation because the Jews understood their role, that they were the chosen people. And so not only was Jesus telling the story about his return, but he was letting them know he was opening up the door to the Gentiles. So there's a whole lot of layers to this, but we're not going to get into the, the heavy duty layers this morning. We're just going to look at the excuses part. So a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. He sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. Here they go. They've been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. They've been invited to spend time with the King of Kings, but they begin to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I have asked you, I, I ask you to have me excused. I would imagine he went and had a look at the ground before he bought it. Very few people buy pieces of ground without looking at them. You know, they didn't have the internet in those days. They couldn't buy it online and then think at an online auction and think, I'll go and look at that. No, they, he looked at it. He'd already seen it. It wasn't going anywhere. Uh, and so I bought a piece of ground. must go and see it. Have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them. Please have me excused. You know, so here we have people more concerned about their investments, their cryptocurrency, their bank accounts, their pensions, whatever it happens to be. We've got our money invested here. We have to just, it's more important than the Lord. Second man, he's, his business was more important than the Lord. The third one, he had a genuine excuse. He said, still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I can't come because she doesn't allow me. <laughs> oh no, sorry, it doesn't say that. <laughs> so relationships, he allowed relationships to come before the Lord and what was happening. And so you think, well, the master didn't say, well, fair enough. Those are all good excuses. 
The servant came and reported these things to his master. The master of the house was angry. Right? One of the translations says very angry. See, God is a God of love, but God can get angry. The Bible tells us we can get angry. It says be angry and sin not. There's some things that make you angry. Unrighteousness, sex, trafficking, people who get the devil catches up in drugs and addiction. There's things we need to be getting angry about. We get angry about all the wrong stuff. I'm going to say something there, but I'll not, I'll not give you an example from our home. Because Mary could give you 10 for every one I give. So he, said, he was angry and said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. The servant said, Master, it's done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say, none of those men who are invited shall taste my supper. And, and so Adam and Eve were put out of the garden. These people were disallowed from being at the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's consequences for our excuses. If, if we're people who go through life making excuses, we're going to end up somewhere we don't want to be. So it's important that we, we, if we are excuse makers, we all make excuses, but some people are professional excuse makers. And so if we're those sort of people, we need to stop. <clears throat> Paul and Romans said this, picking up the same theme. Now the holy anger of God is disclosed from heaven against the godlessness and evil of those men who render truth dumb. Did we ever live in an age where truth is rendered dumb? Do you watch the news? Do you read stuff and you think, this is unbelievable. You couldn't make, this stuff is so stupid. You couldn't make it up. And it's been foisted on us as, as a people or as a, a, a group or whatever. And it just makes no sense in any world. And yet, Jesus, or Paul said, this is what's going to happen. And this is what happens in the world who render truth dominant and operative by their wickedness. Listen to this. It's not that they do not know the truth about God. So when people tell you there's no God and blah, blah, and from God's perspective, God doesn't believe them. I told you recently, we, we chatted to a family. We had to do a funeral, and, and the wife said, uh, he, he doesn't believe in God. He's an atheist. I said, God doesn't believe in atheists. So it's all right. See, God doesn't believe the lies, the excuses. Oh, well, we don't believe in God. Oh, God, uh, we believe in evolution, or we believe X, Y, Z, or we believe you can be this, that, the other thing. God doesn't believe those things. When you stand before him, the excuses won't hold water. And so Paul's telling us up front, those excuses don't hold water. It's not that they do not know the truth about God. Indeed, he has made it quite plain to them, to all of us. For since the beginning of the world, the invisible attributes of God, his eternal power and divinity, have been plainly discernible. No excuses. Through things which he has made and which are commonly seen and known. Listen to what it says. This is J.B. Phillips' translation. Thus leaving these people, these men and women, without a rag, a rag of excuse. No excuses. They knew all the time. Isn't that amazing? People tell you, though, there's no God. I don't believe all that Christian stuff. Paul's saying, here's God's perspective. They knew all the time. It's lies. It's excuses. There's a good verse to tell somebody if you want to punch in the face. <laughs> they knew all the time that there is a God, yet they refused to acknowledge him as such. See, there's the key. Or thank him for what he does. Thus they became fatuous in their arguments and plunged their silly minds still further into the dark. Behind a facade of wisdom, they became just fools. Fools who would exchange the glory of the eternal God for an imitation image of a mortal man or of creatures that run or fly. Or crawl, Superman, Spider-Man, 
<laughs> with all these different things that people, oh, we just love that. People believe in all these things more. They believe in Spider-Man. They believe in Batman and Superman. They nearly believe he's real. They don't believe in God. People are, are strange. I heard somebody saying recently, I think I maybe said this before, somebody said, you know, the Titanic was really a true story. It wasn't just a movie. And, and so we live in a world where people confuse truth with reality. And, and so they have all their, their unrealities as their truths and all the truths as unrealities. So we see this theme following, flowing through the scriptures. Here's the, the, the Greek word that's used in this passage for excuse. I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it properly, but it's anapologetos. And so it's where we get the word apologetics from. So in theology, apologetics is a person, uh, someone who's an apologist is a person who can reason and give reason for why we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, why we believe in the second coming, why we should be baptized uh, by immersion. Someone who can apologetically, they're not making an, they're not apologizing for it. It means it's the logos. They understand the logos. In that word, you can see it is the word apology and the word logos. But this word excuse actually means it's something that's indefensible. It's not justifiable by argument. So if you're an apologist, you can justify the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus by the facts. But an excuse, excuses are different. This is the difference between an excuse and a reason. So an excuse is not justifiable by argument. It's just something made up. It's a lie to pass the blame. A reason is, is a true fact. So I was, a, was late for work today because some big story that you make up. Well, that's an excuse but I was late for work today because I got a puncture or there was roadworks and I hadn't realized that's a reason. And so reasons are fine. It's, it's, we can have reasons for why things don't happen, but excuses are different because excuses, and as Billy Sunday said, some of you will have heard tell of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was an American baseball player who became an evangelist and uh, he lived in the late 1800s, early uh, part of the 1900s, he said, an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. And so we can have reasons for things, but an excuse is the skin of a reason. It's, it's made to look on the outside that looks like a reason, but it's actually stuffed with a lie. That quote always reminds me of sausages. If you go on to the next one. Sometimes sausages are actually a bit like that. They're the skin of a sausage stuffed with no meat. <laughs> Anyway, don't be writing my last three letters about that if your sausages are full of meat. I just said some of them, not all of them. And so excuses are the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. I remember when we moved to Lisburn, we went to Sloan Street Presbyterian Church. I was 16 at the time. And I remember the, the, the minister there, one of the first sermons he preached was this statement that excuse, about excuses. That was nearly 50 years ago, 48 years ago. So it had an impact on me. I've only got around to preaching it now, 48 years later. And so he's, he said this about this, an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. Always remember that every time you're going to make up some excuse that you know is just God's wallop. So the thing is, we don't need to make excuses for why we're not progressing in God, why we're not stepping up in God, why we're not maturing in God, why we're not flowing in our gifting and, and doing new things and what, whatever the thing is in our life. We have all the support we need. And we'll look at this later on as we go through uh, this series, uh, talking a little bit about fivefold ministry. It says, when Jesus ascended into the heavens after his death, burial, and resurrection, it said he handed out gifts. So we all have gifts. People have gifts, but some people are gifts. And so the Bible talks about the fivefold ministry. These people, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. These people are given as gifts to us, to the body of Christ. For, for what reason? To train Christ's followers in skilled servant work working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other 
efficient and graceful in response to God's Son. Fully mature adults, fully developed within and without. That's what Jeanette's talking to us about, about sleeping, about eating, about exercise, about prayer. It's not just an outward thing. It's not just an inward thing. It's both fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. I love how the King James puts it, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Man unto a perfect man. That's this perfect bride that, that Jesus is preparing. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I just love that phrase. For each one of us who know and love Jesus, he wants to come to the place before his coming that we've reached the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I don't know how long it would take to unpack that. But that's an amazing statement, isn't it? And the apostle's not telling us this as a carrot that we can't attain to, something we can't attain to. He's telling this as something that God is expecting of us, that we go from faith to faith, glory to glory, as we walk this road of sanctification, we become more and more and more like Jesus till we reach that place of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's incredible. And so he goes on to say, no long, read this scripture last week, no long prolonged infancies among us, please. In other words, no excuses. We'll not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are easy prey for predators. Because if we, if we keep weak, if we keep as children, the world will, will catch, us, catch us out. Uh, God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and tell it in love. Like Christ in everything, we take our lead from Christ who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy, healthy and whole in God, robust in love. And so he says, no more, no prolonged infancies among us. I thought I would look up some little uh, excuses from children. Most of these are from children. Hopefully you can see them online. Hopefully you can see them at the back, but I'll read them out. The first one in the top left-hand corner, this little guy said, <clears throat> in relation to his homework, my family got a new paper shredder and we had to see if it was working. So that's why his, uh, I thought that tickled me because I got a new shredder on Friday. And so I nearly put the sermon notes through it. I thought, no, not bother. The one below it says, I did my homework in my head and left it at home. <laughs> now there's an excuse. Bottom one's got the dog on. It says, you know, we know that one. The dog at my homework. <laughs> the little boy, I love this one in the middle. It says, I made my worksheet into a paper airplane, but I got hijacked. You know, some of the excuses that we think up, you know, we're laughing at children, we think up some of the most ridiculous excuses. I've listened to excuses. I've had people come to see me. <laughs> I'll not tell you what I said to them, but they've given me all this ex these excuses about why they're leaving church. And then I got up out of my seat, and I said, come and sit in my seat. Uh, and I sit in your seat. And I said, now tell me if you believe that crock that you've just told me when you're sitting in my seat. I said, so you don't want to be coming telling me you're leaving the church. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, fair enough. It's just a load of excuses. I said, look, just tell us you're leaving. Just tell, tell me what you want. I'll not be offended if you said you don't like me, you hate me, you don't like me preaching. I'll sulk for a day, but I'll get over it. Just, just be straight with me. Don't come with a whole lot of cock and bull stories that, that just make you look stupid and make me look like an idiot for listening to them without pulling you on them. See, I never was trained as a pastor. I, was trained, I wasn't trained as a business person either, but I'm the, I'm the person that said the king has no clothes on. And so if you want to... I'm not good at talking nonsense with people and listening to excuses, as maybe you've gathered. This one is a little letter from a mother. It says, Mrs. LaMarche, uh, Alex's brother Henry dropped a meatball on his homework. I did the best I could to recover it. So sorry. 
And so uh, anybody's teachers here, you've maybe seen and you could probably give us a list of excuses. Here's another one. Uh, this is probably either bad spelling or in the American way you spell assaulting. This is a threat weaved into this one. This is a very clever excuse because it's got a threat weaved into it. It says, we had to visit my dad in prison last night after he was put away for assaulting a teacher. <laughs> That's a cracker, isn't it? So you just better watch yourself. <laughs> Here's another maybe not to do with it. Well, this could be to do with homework too. So, 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 sorry I can't today. My sister's friends, mother's, grandpa's, brother's, grandson's, uncle's fish died. And yes, it was tragic. And so here's another list of excuses. We'll not take time to read them, but it's all the usual. The cat, dog, course, pig, at my homework. Didn't feel like it. Homework is, some of your kids probably have said this, homework is really, really, really boring. Uh, I have better things to do, whatever the excuse is. And so just as we finish, and I include myself in this, what's your excuse? What's my excuse? Could be fear, fear of the past, fear of trying something and it failed before, and we don't want to try it again. It could be low self-esteem. It could be like the guys in, in Jesus uh, story, don't have the time, too busy, going to look at a field, got married, whatever. Could be just plain old laziness. Could be procrastination. And, and so procrastination is, a, is the thief of time. It's also the thief of our destiny and our purpose. And so I'm a do-it-now person, and so I like to do it now. Some people like to do it tomorrow. Uh, and uh, but sufficient unto the day as the evil are off. Do what you can do today. There'll be more to do tomorrow. Lack of knowledge. Jesus said people are destroyed uh, because of a lack of knowledge, or the scripture says. So there's no excuse. We've been given the knowledge. We've been given the exceeding great and precious promises. Don't want the responsibility. See, some people don't want responsibility, the stepping up. And yet God has given us the responsibility of sharing the gospel with others. Of We are our brother's keeper. The Bible says that. That's not something out of a Chinese cookie, uh, fortune cookie. We have responsibilities in life. Some people say, I I'm not gifted. Well, well, actually, you are. It's my husband. It's my wife. It's my kids. Someone offended me. They don't tell you it that way. But as you listen to somebody telling you why they don't come to church or they don't do stuff in church, it becomes very apparent it's to do with offense. They make a very elaborate excuse about it, about the, their brothers, dogs, grannies, aunts, cousins, girlfriends, babysitters, husbands, chip shop owners, potato man. But you know it's offense. Uh, I, I say, I just am not good at sitting listening to that stuff. That's why they don't let me into the, the food bank. Because I just say, listen, you're in this position because X, Y, Z. Apparently that, you can't do that. I'm told. So John and Hanan and I are barred. God wouldn't, couldn't use me. Well, that's a lie of the enemy, isn't it? God has called all of us. And so let's remember as I hand over to the band, excuses are lies we tell ourselves so that it doesn't have to be our fault. They're the skin of a reason, stuff of the lie. We want to be connected to Christ and connected to his purposes. There's no more room for excuses.